Welcome to 60 Skills. Today's lecture is, should body speech and mind be referred to as body sensation and mind? Many B Buddhist schools of thought have an interesting method of stacking reality. They refer to this as body speech and mind. In many ways, this is easily described as the physical or material, astral, and mental levels of existence. However, body, speech, and mind also implies a training methodology. Well, one way to look at astral is something that can be sensed, but not touched. Speech definitely falls into this category. The term energy also comes into this category. However, this second category of speech, energy, or sensation, if you will, may be a better way of looking at this issue. Because sensation can capture the nebulous energy that you can sense but not touch, as well as your senses of sight, sound, touch, and taste. So in this regard, referring to speech part of reality or the astral level of reality as the sensation level of reality might actually be a much more efficient way of doing this. Now, why is this important? Of course, when you are dealing with proper training methodology, it helps to have a way of dividing things up into things that are intuitively understood by people. The simple fact of the matter is, is that in the Western canon of practice, real esoteric practice is fairly uncommon. Whereas in the Orient or in Asia, the concept of esoteric practice, even if it's not very often actually performed, is much more deeply ingrained in the popular culture. So people can intuit things like speech to include other factors. Commonly, this is referred to as the use of mantra and light technologies. However, in the West, most of our terms for dealing with this are in fact archaic. Things like egregore, pneuma, and the like are simply not terms that most people are very familiar with. Terms like ether as well come to mind. Now, that said, we are living in a modern age. Another issue that we have with a lot of terminology, particularly written sources, is there is an unusual habit of most written sources reaching more than about 70 or 100 years of age and now no longer being directly accessible to the current generation of people. Buddhism, in most cases, has a very effective solution to this in that they will have their classical text and then a commentary written in a more modern period. And the commentary is directly annotated as, being having, as having been written at a later point in time. So, as we're getting into training methodologies here, it's important to realize that the terminology used has to be something that is well understood by the person reading it. And over time, these can change. In the West, as, a, as has been previously mentioned, these terms are largely so far out of date and so far removed from the day-to-day -day life of most people that they don't even have a cultural background into which to throw this. So this gives us a little bit of freedom, if you will, to simply come up with a, better, with a better term that we can positively define. In this case, sensation captures things that occur at the astral, that involve the senses, that involve energy, and involve things like speech, because you sense speech. It's something you can sense, but you can't touch. So again, it's not my desire to create a whole new vocabulary for these things. It's merely a wish to have a more functional vocabulary for people in order to improve the instructional process. So let's get more into this issue of sensation involving teaching. Another issue with sensation is that that astral level of existence bleeds into both the mental and the physical. In mental terms, it's very easy to co-associate a sensation with an idea. In physical terms, 
it's very easy for sensation to transmute into action or movement in the body. So for this reason, it is one of the things that we train first in the 60 skills system. That exercise of build the chi ball is your primary exercise for training sensation in the beginning. And the reason for this is very simple. Your subtle sense of touch is the least degraded of your senses in terms of its subtle component. Because in many ways, you don't have a sense of touch without its subtle component. For this reason, this is the most easy thing for most people to train without some level of natural ability. Training senses like clairvoyance, clairaudience, or clairgustinance take quite a bit more work, not only because of cognitive dissonance, but because the subtle aspect of those senses is largely undeveloped in most people. So the point of today's lecture was to have people think about potentially coming up with a better language for defining some of the terms that we utilize, and to keep in mind that many texts such as Initiation into Hermetics and a lot of the older Golden Dawn works are becoming increasingly difficult for modern people to access, largely because they were written in a time period that is, for the most part, no longer truly understood by the people living in the current day. That is not to say that these sources don't have value, and that is certainly not to say that all of us don't owe a great deal of debt, both metaphysically speaking and practically speaking, to the practitioners who introduced these materials into our societies. All I'm saying is that many of these things, while not necessarily requiring a refreshing or update, do need some kind of commentary to make them more easily understood in the modern era. And this is something that as practitioners should definitely be thought about. So if you liked today's lecture, please hit the subscribe button down below or the like button as well. And if you would like to learn more about these topics, please check out the links in the details section down below. Otherwise, have a great day and be well.